Hello and welcome to a special video edition of the LifeWorks podcast. Joining me today is Dr. Dan Hill, author of Famous Faces Decoded. Dr. Hill is an authority and world-renowned expert on the role of emotions in consumer and employee behavior and an expert in facial coding to help measure people's decision-making process. He's the founder and president of Sensory Logic, a research-based consulting firm that specializes in working with companies to enhance their sensory emotional connection with consumers. He's appeared on CNN, The Today Show, MSNBC, and Fox Business News. He's also the author of Emotionomics, Body of Truth, FaceTime, and First Blush, among many others. Dr. Hill, it is great to have you on the podcast today. Thank you. It's great to be here. And I must say you have a very attractive smile. Uh, <laughs> well, coming from a, from a facial coder, that is, uh, that's, that's quite a compliment. Thank you very much. <laughs> sure, by all means. It's very kind. So I, wanted, I want to jump right in here, um, Dan. It's, um, it's really interesting what you do. And it's actually been an area of, of, of great fascination for me. And this, this concept of facial coding, how would you describe your expertise to other people? So you're a facial coder. What is that? Uh, that in our faces, we best reflect and communicate our emotions. Uh, Charles Darwin, in his work on evolution, essentially said to himself, why do we have emotions? Why weren't they weaned out of us over the course of evolution? Right. And the truth of the matter is they help us. They help mm -hmm. us survive and thrive. And he came to realize that in your face, you best show what's going on for you, whether you know it or not consciously. And so it is, it's been described as the richest 25 square inches of visual territory in the world, uh, from our eyebrows and eyes down to our mouth. So it's just an incredible opportunity to understand the world around you. Mm. Wow. How did you get interested in the field? Well, I'm going to give you two different answers. I, I yeah. always loved in Monty Python at one point, Eric Idle was playing a British politician and says, right. I'm going to answer your questions in two ways, my regular voice and a high squeaky voice. <laughs> Um, I, I won't take the high squeaky voice route, but I will give you a base, both a professional and a personal answer. Sure, sure. So the professional answer would have to start in 1998, and I'm writing a book for the president of a consulting company, and he knows someone at IBM, and one day the guy sends over an article about the breakthroughs in brain science and how much we are intuitive, emotional decision makers. In fact, as I started tracking down the sources, the conservative estimation, at least 95% of our mental activity is not fully conscious. I mean, that just blew me away. My hands were trembling when I finished reading the article. I said, I have no idea whether I can make a living doing this, but I am simply too intellectually curious yeah. not to go there. Right. So that's right. my professional answer. You want the, yeah. the personal one as well? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. I think it has to be that my family moved to Italy when I was six years old. My father worked for the 3M company, assigned to a film processing plant on the Italian Riviera. You know, really bad break. Uh, but uh, we, we rose to the challenge and we left St. Paul in winter and moved to Italy. And um, it's, it all sounds glorious, but, it, you know, in another sense, I was a stranger yeah. in a strange land. It was yeah. a reverse immigration. Yeah. And I suddenly Absolutely. found myself in Italian first grade in a fishing village, did wow. not know the language, waited all day for the math units. So there was something I could do. And in the meantime, I basically started studying my classmates. You know, what were the cliques? Mm -hmm. who, were, who was in power? What was the personality of the teacher? You know, what in the world was going on around me? Wow. And I have to say, from a personal point of view, it certainly had to start at that point. Yeah. Wow. And, 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 and I've, and I've been to Italy and it is, it's a different, it's a different culture there. You know, it, it's, it's, it, and, and it's, it's different than American culture. Wouldn't you say? Sure. And then I'm from a subculture of America where emotions aren't exactly front and center. Right. I'm Norwegian, right. I'm Norwegian American. We have the famous <laughs> right. comedian Garrison Keillor who has the joke about the Norwegian yeah. American man who loved his wife so much. He almost told her so. <laughs> right. So, so the right, idea right. that I would be a, a uh, you know, global expert on emotions is almost a kind of a cosmic joke. Right, It's right. just not what I should have been. Yeah. The Italians, on the other hand, are famous for being effusive. Right. Lots of body right. language, very, right. you know, flowing. I mean, when Dante was writing the Divine Comedy, his biggest problem was writing the Purgatorio part because everything in Italian sounds beautiful. Right, right, it's right. It's not a language with, you know, nasty consonant sounds predominating. Yeah. And yeah. so, um, you know, in some ways you couldn't talk about two different cultures. Yeah, it's true. It's true. 
<laughs> That's great. So I want to get a little bit deeper into, into just the, the, the functional aspects of, of what you do. Sure. What, what is emotional intelligence? Well, really, if you go by the textbook, there's four things. One is you have to be aware of your emotions. Mm -hmm. And then you have to, you know, deploy them <laughs> in your interactions, actually <laughs> right. understand their, their meaning their, and, and then you start to put them out there. And then in the backside, you, you monitor. So it's awareness, it's management, it's deployment, and it's kind of basically review, you know, how, how did that go? Yeah. Uh, could, I, could I have tried that a different route? You know, some sort of reflection. Yeah. How, how would a person know if, if they are emotionally intelligent? Like what are some of the signs that they, that they have that? Well, I, I think the first thing is we can make everyone feel better. I don't think you ever get to being fully and always, you know, on top of your game and emotionally mm -hmm. intelligent. I think you have better days and worse days, good <laughs> situations and bad situations. Right. I mean, I'm a tennis player and some days my backhand works and some days it doesn't. Right. Right. Uh, yeah, that's just how it goes. And even within a match, it can change, of course. Uh, that's why you have those ebbs and flows. So I think the fundamental thing is, first of all, emotional literacy. Uh, I have spoken at many conferences, as you might imagine, over the yep. years. And every now and then I've played a little game, not in a mean sort of way, but I've begun by showing here are the seven emotions you can capture through facial coding. Right. And can you tell me, you know, audience, <laughs> what is, I, I've got one word that describes the essence of what that emotion is and just do a little mix and match. I, I won't even play games by having eight options for seven answers. Right, right. Seven to seven, you know, just put them together. And the usual turnout was about 35% emotional literacy. 35%. Wow. And this was among typically researchers who spend their lives doing analysis. And many of them would be yeah. focus group moderators, for instance, right. who are really trying to read the room. It's called qualitative research because right. you're trying for quality over quantity. Mm -hmm. And yet they were at 35%, one third. I mean, I, I admit I was, I was stunned the first time I did this. It's why I did it at least two more times because like that can't really be the number. I mean, it must be 50%, it must be 60%. Right. You know? and, and yet on the other hand, I have to say that before I got into this field, if I got the same quiz, I, I might have had the same answer. I'm not sure I really thought through, you know, what is anger? I mean, what causes anger, let alone how does anger manifest itself on the face? I, I think I was just swimming blind to that to a very large extent. And we all are, despite yeah. movies like, you know, anger management and so forth. Right, right. <laughs> so I, I, I feel like I need to ask how, you know, in, in any everyday situation, how do you read someone? And how do you read someone in a way that you don't come off as reading them? <laughs> well, right. the last part can be a little bit trickier. I, mean, right. I, I remember being in a, in a, <clears throat> excuse me, a business meeting once and uh, about four minutes in, the person just swiveled their chair away from me once they understood fully what my business was about. <laughs> and so let's conduct the meeting this way instead. Right, right. So you, you do have to be a little discreet. You know, you don't yeah. just like stare them straight in the face. You have to you know, look a little bit off to the side, maybe swivel back. It, it, you try to be a little bit natural and a little bit yeah. discreet about it. In terms of reading people, though, it's actually surprisingly easy in a way. And I'm not saying that to grandstand, right. but people do have signature expressions. We, we are habitual creatures. You know, I, I eat two or three different kinds of things for breakfast most days. Right. Uh, we all do. We just, we just have routines and we have emotional routines as well. Uh, we have just a default that we often go to. Mm -hmm. the writer George Orwell said, by the age of 50, a man has the face he deserves. <laughs> and there's a lot of truth to that. Um, so yeah, we have part. muscle memory for another yeah. thing. And so then people just gravitate to something. So you right. will very often pick something up. Uh, in my wife's case, I never tell you what they are, mm -hmm. but she does have a signature expression. I saw it the very first time we met almost immediately. Wow. And it's true. She will show it. And it's a combination of two different facial muscle movements that don't go together all that often. Yeah. And yet she probably shows this expression. I'm going to say two or three times within every five minutes and often, you know, two or three times within a minute and a half. Mm. So it is really predominant. And it does now that I know her, it aligns with a lot of things from her upbringing and so forth. So facial coding really goes back in essence to that old saying, actions speak louder than words. And in your right. face, there are 44 pairs of muscles 
and there are 23 expressions or movements or actions mm -hmm. that reveal seven emotions. And that's the secret sauce. That's the core. That's what I offer up in Famous Faces Decoded. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and what, are, what are those seven emotions? Sure. They are, I, I'm going to, I'll play stump the chump with you. How's, sure. how's this? Yeah, so yeah. there are seven of them. You, you guess what you think are the seven core emotions facial coding can get to. I would say um, probably happiness or, or ha happiness or joy. Yep. Um, anger. Yep. Uh, disgust. Yes. Contempt. Very good. Most people wouldn't get that one. That's that, um, four for four. You're, you're in the baseball hall of fame already. <laughs> um, let's see. Sadness. Yep. Uh, fear. Yep. And probably embarrassment. Um, no, it's surprise. So surprise, of course. Yeah. So so six out of seven. But I, I'm talking to Ted <laughs> Williams. I mean, oh, that, this, this you're is, very kind. This, this, is, this is phenomenal. And really, I always have to give you a pass on surprise because in many ways, you could think of it as a pre-emotion mm -hmm. because what follows surprise is a, a, basically an emotional conclusion. Was that a welcome surprise right. or was not welcome? Did I get a new mm. car for Christmas? Did I get a new yeah. car accident? Right, which right. What was it? <laughs> right. <laughs> The reason it qualifies in part is you definitely have facial muscle movement because surprise is about paying attention. Your mm -hmm. eyes go wider, your eyebrows lift. You are literally increasing your field of vision to take something in. Mm -hmm. Something has changed in your environment and you have to adapt. So in a sense, surprise more than any emotion in, in a way goes right back to Darwin and yeah. you know, evolution and adaption and survival and so forth. That, that what sense. is going on in my natural environment so that I can pivot, adjust, right. and, and stay alive. <laughs> that, that's, uh, that, thank you. That's, that, that's, really, that's really fascinating, actually. And it's fascinating, too, that, it, it's, that our facial expressions are evolutionary. Um, it's not, I guess it, it, it stands to reason, right? But it's not, it's not something that you would immediately put, put that together with. You would think that, you know, it's, it may be something that sort of came along later, you know, in, in, our, in our evolution, or maybe as we developed more logic or we developed more intelligence that, you know, maybe our, our face also, you know, evolved with it. But it does make sense that, you know, that it is an evolutionary trait that we have. So, yeah, I mean, I'll just take one other emotion, um, yeah. disgust. So, you know, a couple of really obvious tells for disgust is the upper mm -hmm. lip curls, right. uh, the nose wrinkles. Right. And think of both of them. You know, it's a bad smell. It's a bad taste. <laughs> if, you're, if you're at a pond and, you know, the water is fetid yeah. and poisonous and you're going to double over, yep. you know, with pain very shortly, well, that's a really good chance for the lion to come get you because you can't move too well. <laughs> right, right. So it really has a really basic thing. You know, this is not a good... Uh, you know, food for me to eat because it's going to yeah. sicken me or kill me. Um, so in some ways, these can be really basic. That's not to take away from the eternal mysteries of human nature, let alone sure. the body. Mm -hmm. But there are some ways in which it just seems like a really obvious through path to sure it would show that way. I mean, it just, yeah. it just makes sense in some ways. Yeah, yeah. No, that, that, that's absolutely fascinating. So, I, so I'm really curious to know, is there a way to tell if someone is deceiving you? Uh, well, think about it from an evolutionary point of view. What would be the, the, the problem if someone could tell it really easily? Well, if, if they, that, that's a good question. If they could tell really easily, um, we'd, we'd, have no, we'd have no privacy of thoughts. Yeah, and no camouflage. I mean, think about it. You're you're yeah. with a bunch of pirates, and they can conclude that you just lied to them. Right. I think you're. Right. I think you're overboard. I think you're in the in the Caribbean, you know. Right. <laughs> and and the sharks are coming for you shortly. It's just not a good move from an evolutionary point of view right. to have complete you know lack of opaqueness. You want some degree of ability to hide. Right. Um, right. So it. So it, if we, if it ever was true, and I don't think it was, if it was ever true that there was a muscle movement that gave away lying. Uh, they have no descendants. Yeah. <laughs> they, all, they all passed away rather summarily. Um, 
you know, and in this modern age, of course, the plastic surgeon and the Botox would uh, probably take care of it for us. If, well, and, and, if and, and actually, yeah, and I actually do want to ask you about that. Like, how does that, how does, how do things like, you know, artificial enhancements like Botox um, either suppress or, 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 um, or, or change the configuration of someone's face so that they, you know, so that they can't be as, as expressive as they were. Tell, tell, tell me a little bit about more. Tell me a little bit more about that. Sure. Um, well, first of all, when I started my company, we, we used, because I was pioneering the use of facial coding in business and mm -hmm. Dr. Paul Ekman, who's the expert in this field, who I learned it from, was great. But on the other hand, he never meant to take it into business. Uh, there was no scoring system. There were no right. norms. Uh, you know, I had to create those things. Yeah. Um, and it took some time to, to work out what the protocols would be. So the far easier path was to include biofeedback as kind of a double tracking because that was well established, had definite you know, metrics from reading electro signals, not to make it too complicated. Yeah. Yeah. And you're really looking at two muscles, the smile muscle, uh, the zygomatic muscle and the corrugator muscle, which is the f kind of sometimes called the frown muscle over the eyes, you know, when they knit together right. and lower, for instance, uh, you can be confused, for instance, but it can also show fear and, and sadness. Mm -hmm. And so with biofeedback, you just put two sensors on the face because God knows that's invasive enough already because you got to put some you know, gel on them right. uh, for the reading and then you have to fix them and you have to hope they don't fall off people's faces and so on right. and so forth. Well, lo and behold, when we were in places like Westchester County, which was famous for Botox, mm -hmm. or we were in uh, Houston area, you know, maybe p certain parts of Southern California, depending on who you're recruiting, sure, who is the, sure. the, the subject matter for the test, uh, we had to screen for Botox. Because if we were using biofeedback, when we were in the first four years of the company, that took away half our data because one of the most common places to apply it is that frown muscle, the corrugator region. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so it really destroyed our data because all that would leave left is the zygomatic data. So everyone would be over the moon supposedly about the latest print ad, TV spot, product offering and so forth, which wouldn't be quite accurate. Yeah. So it had real implications. Mm -hmm. The plastic surgery is even more devastating. In my book, uh, Famous Faces Decoded, I have Michael Jackson. Well, mm -hmm. I have Michael Jackson before Michael Jackson became Michael Jackson in some yeah. ways because the more the plastic surgery got enacted, the less I was going to be able to read Michael Jackson as a human being with natural facial muscle movement Yeah, because all the plastic surgery ultimately, there was just so many rounds of it. It just intervened too much for him to be, you know, on natural anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I want to want to dig a little bit deeper into into famous faces decoded. Um, what was the what was the impetus behind it, and what were what was the central message that you were trying to get out, and and what were some of the interesting examples that you found in your research as you developed it? Well, I, I would say that the impetus was at that point I was nearing twenty years of market research, and you know, to me, that phase of my career was kind of moving, moving past that. I wanted to move more into EQ and more into biography and other sorts of things. So there was certainly that, but I also decided it was a point where I was willing to share, you know, the secret sauce that I learned from Dr. Ekman. Yeah. So to me, the book really operated on three levels. Mm -hmm. Those who wanted to just take it as a chance to read about celebrities and learn some things that they didn't already know right. about them and kind of the right. storyline of who they were, that was fine with me because as a boy, the first books I loved were biographies. I just was fascinated by human nature, all its complexities, its intrigue. So I just think these were stories people thought they knew, but didn't really know in a lot of ways right, because right. there was hidden biographical details or things they weren't familiar with or just odd twists. Yeah. Uh, the, the psychologist uh, or actually philosopher Kierkegaard, the Danish philosopher said, out of the twisted timber of humanity, no straight thing was ever made. And it's true. We have these knots in the wood, <laughs> uh, warps in the wood, and everyone, including celebrities, are going to have that. So that's one level which the book functions. Then if I could go through and use facial coding, I could tell people, and one of the most fun parts of the book is the top 10 list of you know, celebrities who index high or low on a given emotion right. and so forth. And follow that. And that's my way of kind of t bringing people in a fun way into, okay, so there is this thing called emotions and how do they function right. and what is characteristic for somebody and not for somebody else. Mm -hmm. 
And then at the deepest level, yeah, I took them through the secret sauce of facial coding. Wow. So it's really a three level book and certainly meant to be fun, but it really, you know, my goal was to deliver the goods for people and allow everybody if they wanted to, to up their game to the extent they were prepared to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, if it was just the EQ, fine. If they wanted to put the EQ and the facial coding together, that's the most powerful one, two punch. Yeah. What, what was the most surprising thing that came about as you, as you developed that, uh, that book? Well, I'd have to admit that one huge surprise, I mean, I've been a Beatles fan all my life yeah. and yet I, I basically drank the Kool-Aid. I, I saw George Harrison as the quiet Beatle and I said, Oh yeah, he wrote while my guitar gently weeps and give me love, give me peace on earth. And <laughs> I thought him as a real gentle soul. Right, right. And I started facing facial coding Georgie Porgy, and George had a real problem with anger. Wow. Um, he wasn't the quiet beetle as much as he was the angry beetle. Now, wow. maybe he was angry because he was kept quiet by McCartney and Lennon, who right. dominated the songwriting credits. <laughs> right. um, but there was a lot of anger in George. And you yeah. could go all the way back to songs like Don't Bother Me off Meet the Beatles and yeah. Tax Man when he's angry about them not making more money and it all going to the coffers of the Queen. Right. Um, right. There was a lot of anger in George. Wow. And that wow. really surprised me. And then I came across this quote where Ringo said, yeah, you never knew which George would show up in the recording studio that day. Some days mm. he was quite a cheerful chap and other days he was going to punch you. Wow. And uh, I, had to, I had to stay alert to what George I had to deal with that day. <laughs> so um, I, think, wow. I think I nailed it, but it really caught me by surprise. I mean, you want to talk about someone I thought I knew? Yeah. Um, I wow. didn't. I didn't yeah. know him until I, 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 I saw without seeing until right. I did the facial coding. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and he was, you know, a hero of sorts to you, right? Somebody that you looked up to. I mean, part of the, one of the greatest yeah. bands ever. And Yeah, no, I mean, While My Guitar Gently Weeps is one of the most majestic songs in the Beatles catalog, for instance. Yeah. I mean, it just is. Um, so, yeah, yeah, a complete surprise. Wow, wow. So I want to I, I wanna shift, shift the the conversation a little bit to what's going on today, our, you know, our current events, you know, we're, you know, here we are, this is a very, you know, common occurrence, you know, doing Zoom meetings and video meetings and in, in this new coronavirus, you know, environment. Um, in, in, in terms of, in terms of this, you know, current pandemic, how do you think it will change how we communicate with others? Well, that's a, that's a big and good question. So let me tackle it in a couple of ways. One, let's just start with Zoom or any yeah. video conferencing yeah. that goes on. Um, with technology, it's as good as it is in improving. And certainly when I started my company, my God, we would take a camera, drop in a cassette, you know, and you know, right. set it right. up at the end of the uh, end of the room. And now you can do all this stuff on the internet. And thank God, because it's so much easier. Yeah. That said, Zoom will, you know, flatten the image. And there'll be some time delay warps, you know, maybe too subtle for you and I to entirely pick up consciously, mm -hmm. but they are going on. So it, it, first of all, introduces a real problem potentially for micro expressions, mm. because the fact of the matter is there are times it could be, maybe it could be as brief as one thirtieth of a second, you know, yeah. which is awfully brief, but I would say more often a micro expression might be about one sixth of a second. Mm. you know, a few frames, but that could be how someone is really feeling before, for instance, they try to go poker face or right. throw the camouflaging smile, <laughs> you know, across their face. Yeah. So those little trimmers as they were, uh, could be what's really going on for someone that they may not consciously know, or maybe they do at some dim level and they, and they move to hide it. But those are really important, you know, barometers of what's going on in the situation. And Zoom could very likely rob us of some of that, in the flattening. And then I just think we can get a little bit alienated even from our own feelings because the, the time delays as slight as they are can, you know, I think in some way play a little bit of havoc with mm. our psyche. I'll never forget. I don't remember which network it was for, whether it was Fox or MSNBC or CNN, but in 2008, I'm, I'm on the uh, trail doing, running my business, but also doing these interviews. I'm in Cleveland yeah. And uh, they've got this, the, the studio there is not very good. And they got this old fashioned TV and I have to kind of look into it. So I've already got a time delay because you know, you're remote. Right. And then the TV goes out. Oh no. So, <laughs> I mean, I, I work visually, you know, suddenly right. I do not see what the network is showing the viewers 
as to the expression. I'm not even sure which candidate they're talking about necessarily. Right. And so I just have to wing it. And it reminds me of a famous story about Ronald Reagan, where supposedly, I think he was just starting his career, if I'm not mistaken. He's in Davenport, Iowa. He's covering the Chicago Cubs. And the feed dies from the game. Oh, and man. Radio, but he just ad-libs for several I- innings. He just makes up the whole baseball game. <laughs> um, you know, and, and politicians have been accused of making up more than a few things. But sure. uh, that's what I had to do in that case. And it kind of ties back to this time delay issue. Yeah. Um, masks are another factor here. Hmm. When masks. you're wearing a oh, mask, sure. if you are, you're only going to see the upper portion of the face. Well, that's about one third of all of these facial muscles, these 23 that I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And what you can see more readily around the eyes, it tilts more toward fear and surprise. Mm -hmm. Now, when you introduce the dominant emotions uh, or just the seven emotions through facial coding, where you did such a great job, and I'm talking to Ted Williams, well, you started out with happiness and anger. Um, You know, bravo twice over because those are the two most dominant emotions. Mm. But those are not the two most dominant emotions around our eyes. Mm. So there's a disconnect on that basis. Then we have to take it a little bit broader sociologically because, you know, who's still forced to go to work and not on Zoom? Right. They tend to be minorities. Uh, 40% of women who have a career where they make less than 25000 in a career have been laid off, 40% of them yeah. in the last two months. Right. So you've got some huge disparities going on racially economically and by gender as who's been affected. So they're not on Zoom. They're either lost their job or they're forced to be quote unquote essential workers, Yeah, um, which is our way of thanking them now finally. But uh, I would argue they were always essential workers. Mm -hmm. We only kind of recognize they're essential now. Well, my God, they're they're in a very stressful situation. They're still trying to put dinner on their table. Uh, while helping us get dinner on our table, for instance, just to take grocery store people, uh, but it could be nurses and so on and so forth. Um, So they're in a fraught situation. And then we kind of lollygag and and come in, (laughs) not really to the the hospital, mind you, but the grocery store, for instance. Mm -hmm. And that's going to suddenly remind me of a, just a searing photograph I remember seeing is the Vietnam War. And two lines are passing each other. And one is all the guys going off to college. And the other one's all the guys headed to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And they were just two different pictures, those two lines passing each other. And one was very white and, you know, more upscale. And the other one was more minority and farm boys and uh, just a different graphic. So we're going to have a workplace that, you know, is, you know, some fault lines have been exposed (laughs) Mm -hmm. within our culture. Uh, people have not spent time around each other. They're going to be nervous. I mean, what happens if they have one colleague in the office who wears a mask and others don't? Right. I mean, th- th- so the the level of of resentment, mm-hmm. you know, which is a trigger for anger, and anger is already a pro- uh, you know pretty prevalent emotion. Right. I mean, very right. prevalent emotion. Uh, the odds that anger is going to go up as a proportion seems pretty obvious to me. Fear is already up. So you've really taken the usual mix and you've kind of turned it around because happiness and anger, both kind of around, you know, about 30, 35% of of our emoting typically as human beings. That's what my research would show over the years. Wow. So you take 100%, quite obviously, and you take those two heavyweights as 30, 35% each. That leaves all the other five emotions as normally just the crumbs on the table. (laughs) But now you've taken happiness away. Yeah. And that leaves room for anger to grow. Fears grabbed, so to speak, more emotional market share. Mm-hmm. We've got a very different dynamic. Uh, sadness could be up. Sadness can be a sign of isolation, yeah. of loneliness, of sense of hopelessness. Um, you know, if I were to go out and, and do a lot of coding now, uh, I think there's, and you can also get access to people's homes. Uh, right. I think there's really good odds that's up. Yeah. So um, we, it's just not the same ball game. So it's a great question. Uh, I gave you a really complicated answer, but yeah, it's no, a complicated sure. situation. Yeah. What do you, th- you know, in light of all that, how do we need to adjust to be more sensitive to others, you know, given all of that complexity? Well, I would probably go back to surprise because surprise par, par excellence is us paying attention. So mm-hmm. if you walk into new territory, I mean, here, here's a, a kind of a fun little analogy. Anytime I'm driving to someplace I've never gone to before, 
those five miles, I keep checking my speedometer. Did I miss the turn off? You know, right. Am I really there yet? Right. Th those five miles seem to take forever. If that's a route I already know mm -hmm. and I'm comfortable and I know where the turn off is and it's in the daytime or whatever, yeah. those five miles just blow by most times unless there's a lot of stoplights involved. Sure. So entering new territory just you know, puts us on edge, which yeah. paradoxically can actually make us both more alert sensitive to our surroundings and also can freeze us a bit mm -hmm. so that we don't take in information quite as well on, an, on another level. Yeah. And so we're all going to be in new territory. And so that behooves us to pay attention better and to also be more empathetic and to, in some manner, still be true to ourselves in terms of anxiety, but um, try to overcome it in some ways, try to honor it in other people, mm -hmm. um, you know, what doesn't work to my mind, and I guess I'll have to reveal my politics a bit, is, you know, to come with a gun and say, I don't wear a mask, but I carry a gun, so I'm now a weapon twice over uh, <laughs> because I could be carrying the virus. And I've got a, you know, not just a handgun, which maybe you could justify, maybe not a gun because I'm going hunter because I'm a deer hunter. Right. I could potentially see both of those. Mm. You tell me you've got a semi-automatic weapon that you're going to carry to the state capitol. I'm sorry, but I, I don't follow along at that point. That yeah. doesn't seem like the Second Amendment as George Washington meant it. Right, right. Yeah. Um, as, we, as we engage in more virtual types of communication, because I, I could see this being a trend, um, w how do we make the most of, of this type of communication? You know, being virtual, uh, being in our homes, things like that. What, what, as a as a professional um, facial coder, as as a as a professional uh, in terms of emotions, what would you recommend in terms of making the most of these kinds of interactions? Well, I I actually think what one of the things that happens when you slow down, and we've been forced to slow down in mm. lockdown mode. Mm -hmm. um, sure, I think human nature is such that you want to entertain yourself, so it's natural to run to your Netflix account and see what you've never had a chance to see. <laughs> I, I remember someone once saying, "Well, right. you know, almost as soon as we had farmers, we had farmers who started figuring out how they could make wine." Um, right, right. There, there is a, an escapist element to human nature. Right. Uh, but at the same time, I would also say it's an opportunity for reflection when things slow down. I mean, sadness slows us down. Sadness in some ways operates, as I call it, the rear view mirror emotion in famous mm. faces decoded uh, because you, you physically and, and mentally in many ways slow down almost as if nature to my mind is saying, you just made a mistake. You just got in, tr in trouble. Slow down. Don't make the same mistake quite so quickly. Uh, I think we could take that slow down as a chance potentially for some reflection. Yeah. And so I think that is an opportunity because uh, we do have to look out for ourselves. I mean, we are under stress. My wife is listening to a, a good deal of NPR and, you know, it's, it's causing anxiety. Uh, you know, there are some bright spots. I mean, maybe the Oxford lab will come through with a vaccine soon, yeah. but you know, if you're looking for light at the tunnel, you know, it may be there. It may be a mirage. We don't yet know. Right. And uh, yeah, I've done a lot of research in, in my book, Emotionomics, in the chapter on leadership. I also spent a good deal of time looking at how people handle transitions and stress periods, mm -hmm. which often are the all too inevitable company reorg. Right. I mean, it just, it's amazing how companies reorg. I sometimes think it's that the leaders are playing the Greek gods and they get bored and they decide to, you know, mix it up just because mm -hmm. they feel like it. Uh, I suspect the real reason is because they, in this, in this era of litigation, they decide it's easier just to move a lot of deck chairs on the right. Titanic rather than a few of them. <laughs> but it, but it, sends, it sends the poor employees into a tailspin. Right. Uh, they got mortgages, car payments. Um, this may be the job they wanted to retire in. No yeah. one knows what's going to happen. And the research shows, you know, over and above my own, shows that uh, what happens to us is, we can handle the stress for a bit. We can rise to the occasion. And when it's too prolonged and with too much uncertainty, it just burns us out yeah. eventually. And I remember I went through for this and I interviewed people uh, for some charts in that part of the book. Uh, I interviewed employees who had gone through reorgs. Yeah. And, uh, you know, this is another case just like the virus. And right now where happiness just, you know, dissipated. Yeah. The levels of happiness in my charts, which are normally in the 30, 35, 40% range, maybe even higher, depending on the work, 
they were, you know, 7%, 10%, 12%. I mean, they were, they were emaciated. They were one third of them, their own. Mm -hmm. uh, I just saw on NBC nightly news yesterday, there was a nurse who had then gone to a, a party in Miami just before the virus really hit big. Yeah. He thought you'd be immune. Even though he's a nurse, he somehow thought this because we like to fool ourselves as human beings. Right. And he had a before and after picture and he lost over 50 pounds. He went from this pretty muscle bound Hulk to this skeleton frame. Wow. And that's what the fight to stay alive and survive COVID-19 in the hospital came down to for him. So happiness wow. atrophies. And so I think we do have to try to take care of ourselves mm -hmm. and we have to recognize that this is going to induce a lot of stress. And so to say we do it safely, uh, connecting with people, feeling like we belong, yeah. finding meaning in our lives. I mean, you know, security to the extent we can do that. Maybe the routines sure. we set up to safeguard ourselves. I mean, those are some of the absolute fundamentals of being happy. It's, it's ultimately yeah. not more Netflix and, you know, another bowl of cereal. Right. Uh, it, it's more likely to be something a bit more profound. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and I, I think you're really touching on something really, really big there, actually, is, is the need. One of the a couple of things that I heard as you were talking was, you know, one, the, the need to connect with people, yeah. you know, and, and, um, and, and also just, you know, establishing, you know, safeguard, you know, types of habits. I would even, I would even add just you know, or even to double down on, on what you've said, you know, just to really take time and count your blessings. Right. And, um, and, and it, it's, it's, it's really, it, it's a, it's a really profound situation that we found with that we have found ourselves in. Um, the, um, I think the, 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 the question I have for you is how can a person make themselves feel good uh it's a good question and you maybe actually gave me the answer in what you just said a moment ago because mm. it's gratitude yeah. i mean i think this is a moment where maybe i can't get happiness back up to 35 percent. right right but 25 percent would look awfully good under the circumstances with record <laughs> unemployment and a yeah. virus with no vaccine um so where do you find the meeting maybe it's a chance to call an old friend from high school yeah. From college days from you know a sports team that's you know defunct or you right. don't play in that league anymore uh, maybe it's reconnecting with your parents uh, yeah. more often or in a different way than you have before it could be a, uh, a sibling mm -hmm. um, so I, I think a lot of this goes you know we are social beings emotions are really contagious yeah. uh, the emotional part of the brain probably pretty much in evolutionary terms uh, grew larger and came into it, its real existence because we were at a point in evolution where we were going from being nomads to being in villages, being more agrarian. Mm -hmm. And so we had to have a bigger brain and a more emotionally oriented brain because it was no longer fighting the tiger. It right. was in some ways fighting and cooperating with our fellow human beings in that village setting. So yeah. we needed the additional brain power and emotional sensitivity to read the situations we were in. Mm. So being so people centric as we are, it doesn't mean you have to be a, a party goer because that's not what I'm recommending in this time of lockdown. <laughs> right. But it does mean there could be some really seminal connections that are worth nurturing, revisiting, uh, reinvigorating, and so forth. I, I think that's at least one excellent place to go. Yeah. No, that's that, that that's that's great. Thank you for that. Sure. Uh, I want I want to get into as I'm sort of you know kind of rounding rounding the <laughs> uh, round rounding up the. Uh, the, the interview here, I, I want to talk a little bit about legacy and, and what your, what your legacy uh, is going to be. You know, you've, you've been doing this a, a long time. You're an absolute, you know, like I said earlier, a world renowned expert uh, in, in, um, in, in emotions and, fo and facial coding. You know, what, what would you say is, is your, is your mission in, 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 in life? Sure. Well, when that person at IBM sent over the article from American Demographics, the one about the breakthroughs in brain science, mm -hmm. um, I think the reason why my hands were trembling, because by then I had left academia and entered the business world. And I was a little 
I guess I'm gonna have to say freaked out by it because I remember yeah. in, in, the, in the building I was living in, there was a consultant down on the first floor and she said to me, remember Dan, now that you're in the business world, there are no problems. There are only <laughs> opportunities and challenges. That's right. And I said, what kind of Orwellian world have I entered where yeah. we can't admit that we have negative feelings or problems to deal with? That's right. So I would say the overriding mission in some sense was to humanize business or do a reality check and say, let's admit that it's not B to B to B or B to C. It's it's people to people, P to P. Yeah. And you have colleagues, you have customers, right. you have business allies. They're all people. Yeah. And that we were going to do better in business, quite po probably, but certainly as human beings, mm -hmm. if we could get back to that ground truth. Um, you know, one way I guess I think of that is, um, you know, very famously, of course, Descartes, the French philosopher said, I think, therefore I am. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was the height of the Enlightenment era. Right. What the breakthroughs in brain science are telling us in a much more contemporary setting is it's more like, I feel, therefore I am. Hmm. Wow, and, and maybe I work in a little bit of thinking, but it's a lot more. I feel there for I am, and Damasio, Antonio Damasio, a famous you know neurobiologist, made that same statement. In fact, wrote a book called Descartes' Air, which was mm. pretty seminal to wow. my getting into this work. So I would say it was it was certainly that trying to humanize business, right? Um, but beyond that, you know, there's a wonderful quote someone said: "There are two currencies uh, in life, and they're dollars and emotions, and maybe they work together." But, but even setting aside the dollars and the business aspect of this, right. it's really quite shocking how, how little we know about emotions. I mm. mean, you know, if someone, you know, if, if we're selling something to somebody and it costs $10 and they hand us a $5 bill, we object rather readily. Right. We, we can tell that that's bad commerce. Right. Uh, emotionally, it's amazing. You know, we, we get handed counterfeit currency all the time and we don't do a very good job of recognizing it or dealing with it. Right. So for something that's so fundamental in life, we're really kind of out to lunch. Yeah. So I would say that's the first two parts of your answer. And if they manage to get as far as picking up on facial expressions, you know, that's kind of, you know, the, the cherry on the Sunday. Uh, but it could be wonderful. And it's a really good tool for know what's going on. I mean, we are so much more Watson than Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we just are. And of course, Sherlock Holmes has that wonderful put down of Watson where he says, you have an instinctive grasp of the obvious. Um, I'm not even sure we have an instinctive grasp of the obvious every day. Yeah. Uh, we move rather dimly through our lives, and you know, myself included. And uh, that, it is what it is. I mean, how often do you look back at a relationship or your friends do for you and say, what did you see in dating so-and-so? Right, you go, right. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, yeah. We try to fashion an answer. Right, right. Um, as you're as you as you're heading into this this next stage in life, what what legacy do you want to leave behind? Uh, that'd be a quite different answer in some ways, and and mm. there's two different components to that because as my wife correctly accuses me, I I love to make everything endlessly complicated. <laughs> I never like the simple answer. Sure. I guess that's where my academic training and background comes from. I grew up in a college town. Yeah. Um, so there's two aspects to it. One is, well, even three. So, so one is uh, I want to create these one day EQ oriented workshops. Mm -hmm. For me, that's a really a humanistic way to pay off on the learnings from sensory logic. I've got 20 yeah. years of a really unique data set. Yeah. And I, I think I can use that so that anyone who's in the customer experience, <laughs> who's mm -hmm. in marketing, who's in mm -hmm. leadership, sales, there's so many applications and I think I can actually make them more successful in their career. And if they come because of the personal development side of it, I can help there too. So yeah. I like the interactions and I think I can use the stuff I've done work in to bring some value. Because I've also looked at uh, couples. I've done things for like the Science Museum in Minnesota on Valentine's Day where yeah. I, I gave couples questions about who they were and their value system and how it could affect their marriage. So there's so many applications. So I think that's one answer. Mm -hmm. uh, but I also want to launch these Americana uh, tours. I'm going to call them Faces and Places tours. Yeah. Uh, I'll just give you one flavor. So I want to do one that's going to be from Memphis to Nashville or vice versa or a round trip because that gives you everything from the blues and, and Elvis Presley and Johnny Cash to the variety of things you got up in Nashville with the That's right. Grand Ole Opry. So music's really emotional. Yeah. You know, we, yeah. we dance to the music, not to the words. 
right? And um, <laughs> it, it, is, it has a profound effect on us. So to me, that brings in biography. It brings in a sense of place. It mm. brings in history. It brings in culture. So it brings all sorts of threads that I've been interested in my life. I'm not smart enough to be a Renaissance man, but I'm kind of a Renaissance child. Mm. And so it gives me a chance to put those pieces together. And I told you, I, I started my reading life with an interest in biographies. Yeah. The other thing is that I'm just about to launch a, uh, on a channel that's actually devoted to books called the New Books Network. I'm mm. about to become a podcast host myself, and it's going to be called Dan Hill's EQ Spotlight. Nice. And although I'm nominally in the psychology channel, uh, I am actually given free license to Rome, which is good for me. And it's a special series on the, on the platform. And I'm interviewing authors of all different stripes, uh, just because I'm, I'm curious about how we can learn about their subject matter, them, sure. and how you can bend their subject matter in a EQ sort of direction. Right. That's true right. whether it's discussing uh, Donald Trump, the Beatles, customer mm -hmm. service experience, marriages, um, put it through the emotional lens and see if we right. can lift our game. So I want to have fun with it, but I want to have an educational component. So there, there's my three-headed answer for you. Yeah, no, it's, it sounds amazing. It looks like you, you have you. It looks like you have a lot, uh, a lot left to give. Actually, like. Yeah, there, there's a little more gas in the tank. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, what, what one piece of advice uh, would you offer uh, in light of your experience? What one piece of advice would you offer to everyone? Whoa, tough question. Um, I'm going to go to my man, Oscar Wilde, who mm -hmm. said, be yourself, everyone else is taken. <laughs> I, I think a lot starts with authenticity. Yeah. You know, in facial coding terms, if the expression comes on too quick, lingers too long, goes away too rapidly, if it's asymmetrical because it's pulled onto the face in a self-conscious fashion, if we try to go poker face, um, these are all ways in which we are you know, trying to throw off the signals to yeah. other people. We're trying to hide. I went on a non-hunting safari to Botswana some years ago, and it's, I really felt for the animals. It's a stressful life. You know, they can be eaten day or night. <laughs> there's, no, right. there's no place to hide, and every animal has a built-in camouflage. So I forgive human beings and myself yeah. for not always wanting to be, you know, in the spotlight. Uh, Irony of Ironies, given the title of my podcast series. Right. But right. I, I think... You, <laughs> You just, you burn out from lack of comfort. You, you know, you mm -hmm. can't handle the stress endlessly. And so if you're not comfortable with who you are yourself, there is this ongoing corrosive stress that's in your psyche and body. Yeah. You acknowledge it or not. It might be some fear you haven't addressed. People smarter than me have said, maybe the best question to ask yourself or anyone else is, what's the one thing you're most afraid of? Mm. You know, or what's the one thing you're most ashamed of that you've done in your life? Uh, because that, you know, embarrassment typically is in front of others. Yeah. Uh, but a shame or shame is more inside you. It's more internal. Right. And ultimately, the person you have to be with 24 hours a day is yourself. Right. right. And so I think you have to get back into that kind of territory. You know, what are you ashamed of? What are you afraid of? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that that's going to be rich territory because there, there will be something there. Yeah. You know, yeah. biggest regret. There, there, there's going to be something there in every single instance. And you may not be able to resolve it. You know, we don't get to live a perfect life. I right. mean, maybe, maybe you have, Mark, but I, I haven't quite <laughs> managed it. Not at um, all. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I, that's rich territory and that's homework yeah. worth doing. Um, mm -hmm. And you maybe can't do it every hour of every day because it's right. going to be painful work. Right. But even a little bit of it, even, even one, one, you know, spadeful. Uh, yeah. out of the garden of that work might, might, uh, right. you know, might be a bumper crop someday down the road. Yeah. <laughs> was that, was that a, an evolution for you personally? Like where, where in terms of authenticity, because as, as, as you and I talk, I, I would consider you a very authentic person and someone who's very comfortable with themselves. Was that something that you were, that you always had, or was that something that you, you had to work into over the years? Um, well, in one sense, I would say I, I've always been very much a uh, truth teller. You know, when I was in mm -hmm. high school and read about the, the so-called muckraker, muckrakers, the journalists right. of the early 20th century that Theodore right. Roosevelt lionized, 
Um, you know, my, my heart goes out for people like that who challenge the status quo, right. who say there's something bad here. But mm -hmm. it's sure a lot easier to find it in others than in yourself. Right. So right. I would say, yes, there was a step change at one point. I mean, certainly going to Italy as a boy was one. Yeah. But, um, you know, I did go through a divorce where my uh, wife at the time fell in love with a colleague at work. Mm. And I kind of saw it coming. And I wasn't entirely happy in the marriage myself, but I wouldn't have been leaving it. Um, yeah. But this, 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 this happened. And, uh, you know, over dinner, finally, one day, she said, I, I'm leaving you and I'm leaving you for another guy. And she said his name, but I already knew who it was because we had gone on vacation with that couple. Yeah. Um, so, you yeah, know, that it was my high school sweetheart. So that, that threw me for a spin, even if there was some way in which I felt the relationship was in trouble or had its limitations or tired of it. Um, you yeah. uh, know, that, that was tough. And that's really what... Uh, almost primed the pump. So when this uh, article came along from the IBM guy, wow. because I, I was reading some other stuff in the psychology field, trying to understand how I felt. And I wouldn't say that I had answers necessarily, but I was exploring. Mm -hmm. So I, I was in an open, inquisitive mood. Yeah. And um, so when that came down the pike, it was like, yeah, uh, it doesn't solve everything, but it solves the question of what I'm going to try for a career. But again, I had no idea whether I would succeed. My, my first client proved to be target for the question wow. whether or not they would sell the department stores that were the origins of the company. Mm -hmm. But it took me nine months to land my first client because I was a pioneer. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I didn't know whether I was going to succeed. I had very little money. By the time I first made some money, I thought maybe I'll just be moving into my parents' basement and uh, <laughs> figuring out the next thing I'm going to do because uh, I was pretty much bereft um, and yeah. just managed to get that uh, lifeline just in time. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I, so, uh, as, as we finish, as we finish up our, our, our time here, where can people find you online? Sure. That's uh, kind of you to offer. There is uh, of course the obligatory three W's followed by sensorylogic.com. That's the name of my company as in your five senses. Mm -hmm. Um, so that has a wealth of information, uh, including, yeah, how you can buy my books and, you know, speeches and, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I do have a, a blog that I do as well as everything else called Faces of the Week, where I try to tie it into the headlines and look for a visual and a little bit of a facial coding EQ opportunity for people. And that can be found at emotionswizard.com, hmm. uh, emotions, plural, wizard.com. Uh, or you can just look for Faces of the Week if you, you know, Google it like everything yeah. else in life. Right. Um, so, yeah, there's all sorts of the other social media. And we're going to have a revision of the website up very shortly where I'm going to try to make it easier for people to, you know, go ahead and, and click on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn right. and all those sweet things. But they're, they're all there and th yeah. they can all be enacted. No, that's, that, that's awesome. I, I have to tell you, this has been an absolutely fascinating conversation and and i i look forward to uh, i look forward to future conversations uh with you uh but but i also look forward to uh to following you and 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 seeing seeing more of your work as it as it uh, develops and progresses well that's that's very kind of you you have a what i call a, a champagne smile sometimes because <laughs> it's not just the 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 cheeks coming up you get that twinkle in the eye because the muscle around the eye tightens no. <laughs> and that's called a true smile or joy oh thank um, so it, it's it's been a pleasure to talk with you L likewise dan thank you so much thank you of course all right thank you. you take care now